All right, we're recording. So, welcome to Solutions. And, right, we're doing Solution Chemistry. Um, I don't know if Janae's there, but I wore this outfit for her. So, this is like my mermaid outfit because we're doing Solutions. And this was some video I was watching. And the guy kept saying, you are enough. And so I thought I'd share that with all of you. It's kind of a cliche thing. But I thought since we were doing solutions, I could be a mermaid and a squid, because that's what it's about. So the key with solutions, on Thursday, I'm gonna go through some of the terminology more, but a solution is always made up of two parts, which is a solute and a solvent. Um, and there's a lot of S words here. So you want to be careful. You can't abbreviate as SOL, um, because that means something else too. But the solute is being dissolved. And it's usually the minor or the smaller component. So the simplest solution would be salt water. So the salt would be the solute. And the solvent is the major component. Or, um, and it's doing the dissolving. So it's dissolving the solute. Uh, and this is where the myth of water as the universal solvent comes from. That water is considered the universal solvent. Uh, but it doesn't actually dissolve everything. It only dissolves things that are polar. Um, it's just 80% of this planet and our bodies is water. So um, unless you're, if, if you are not told the solvent, like in the first question, um, actually I tell you the solvent, but if you're not told the solvent, you assume it is water. Um, but on question one, just walks us through all of the units and my little eraser. I have to say the squid hat erases better. Maybe not. All right, so let's go through this. So 6.9 grams of sodium bicarbonate. And this is where I usually ask if anybody remembers the symbol for sodium which hopefully you all remember sodium is Na. Here's my periodic table. You're gonna be using it um, quite a bit with this homework set. And we have 100 grams of water. So the water is the solvent. Anytime water is present, it is the solvent. Uh, no matter what you read online, there's a lot of people who post things online that aren't quite correct but we always consider water as a solvent. Um, we will see some examples on the next page where there'll be a different solvent, but if water is present, it's a solvent. And what we're gonna walk through now are these um, four different units and define them. So the first one says percentage and then M per M. It used to be percentage W for W for weight per weight but the correct term is M per M, which means mass. So this is based off of the mass. And so the units are the grams of the solute over the total grams or the grams of the solution. So the denominator in a percent is always the total. So it's a part over the total. Um, so a lot of students will look at this and say, oh, well, it's 6.9%, but the answer, my answer is correct because water is not the total. The total is 106.9 grams because this has to be the solute plus the solvent. And I would tell you that's probably the most um, missed piece for students is they forget to total everything up. They just assume water is everything. Um, this is different from what you just had a midterm on, which was solids, liquids, and gases. This is aqueous. 
So solids, liquids, and gas imply a pure substance that you're only dealing with one thing. We're now mixing things together. All right, and then you would multiply by 100 and you get my answer 6.5%. Two sig figs, because I was very vague on my number. But that's pretty simple, that's pretty straightforward. So that's percentage by mass. And again, it's over the total. All right, the second one is an funky X. And this stands for mole fraction. And it is almost the same as the previous one, but instead of grams, it is the moles of whichever one you want. We're gonna do the solute, uh, but you could do the moles of the solvent over the total moles. So we would have to figure out our moles of each one of these, uh, which you guys know how to do that, right? You would change your grams to moles. So you would add this all up and it comes out to like around 84 grams per to one mole on the periodic table and we get some number and I apparently didn't do all that work. Uh, and the same with the water, you would figure out how many grams per mole and you could find its moles. And just, I will leave that for you guys to do. Um, so in terms of this problem, this, this would be moles of the solute. You would have so many moles of the sodium bicarbonate uh, one of the things I would tell you, let's erase all these extra words, um, is labeling is the key here. You have to label everything very clearly. So you can't just say grams and you can't just say moles. Um, so this is different from what you just did with gas laws where you were dealing with just one thing present you have to tell me it is grams of the solute or um, moles of the sodium bicarbonate. And then in the denominator, we would have our moles of the sodium bicarbonate plus whatever our number is for the moles of the water. And I know you guys know how to change grams to moles, so I will leave that. You can pause the video and this is not a percentage. It is always just numbers. Somebody needs to mute themselves. I don't have that master. Alright. So the next one is M. It's a little M, and that stands for molality which is a brand new term, I'm pretty sure for all of you, as opposed to the one below it, which is a capital M. Uh, and so it's really important that your font, how you write things is very clearly, because these have different meanings to a chemist. So capital M is much more used. It stands for molarity. So I'm gonna talk about that one first. That was moles per liter, is how you probably learned it back in Chem 221. Uh, that is not good enough for what we're doing right now. That you can never just say moles or grams or liters. In this chapter, the key to doing this chapter and doing it well, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat this and tell you solutions are really simple. Solutions can be simple if you label everything fully. So the units always have two parts. It's moles of the solute. So don't just ever just say moles. And it's liters of the solution. Molality, uh, which is a little m and it's a like italic or cursive m, is also moles of the solute, which in this problem would be the sodium bicarbonate. And this is the weird part. It is over kilograms of the solvent. It is the only unit in which the denominator is not the total moles, the moles like here, the grams of the solution or the moles of the solution or the liters of the solution. Molality is the solute over the solvent. 
So in terms of this problem, we would find the moles of the sodium bicarbonate, which I forgot to do earlier, uh, which we just do up there, and then over the kilograms of just the H2O. And that's why you have to label always fully, completely. And you would get what my answer was, 0.82. And the unit, two ways you can write the unit. You can write it just as the little m, but you write it, uh, most people write it as moles per kilogram. And we'll do a problem. The next problem I actually worked out, so I'll walk through all the steps. Um, for molarity, my answer is a question mark, not because I didn't do it ever. Uh, it is because you cannot do it with this problem. And it is because there's no possible way you can figure out the liters of the solution. You need the density. So we know the mass of the solution, we know the moles of the solution, but we have to be able to change it to volume. And to do that, you need density. And on the next one, we're gonna be able to do it. So the correct answer would be, you cannot solve it without the density of the solution. So that's key. All right, before I erase, before I ask you for questions, there is something else I need to point out. Um, well, two things. One is the percent. You multiply by 100 to get to a percent. So this would be 6.5%. Mole fraction is a fraction. It is always a number less than one. You don't multiply by a percent. Um, so it's 0 0.015. So it's telling you how much of it in terms of molecules is each one of them. So, um, it's mostly water. Our sample is mostly water. All right, before we do the next one, this, the purpose of this question has always been just to show you what each of the units mean. Um, and we're gonna do the first, or I'm gonna do the first four pages today. And any of you who have to leave, you can just, you just step out because you can leave at any time. Um, when I do this on Thursday, we'll go back over these units again. And um, that's the key. And then we're going to start doing different things with the units. But is there questions before we do the next problem? Before I start erasing. You guys are muted, so just push your space bar if you have a question. All right. And I know my answers are good because I've used this problem set for years and years and years. So this is, again, my little mermaid outfit. So it's like I have seaweed and we're all in this ocean swimming. And the best part is this outfit was made for me when I was 10 years old. So I haven't grown. I know you guys can't see me. Only a couple, most of you know me, but some of you have never met me really. All right, we're gonna walk through number two. And on number two, it says you have a 28% NH3 solution. And it says by mass. So by mass means this is M per M. And then it tells us that it has a density of 0 0.90 grams per milliliter. So we will be able to do molarity this time. So this is why this question's here. All right, and then it wants you to state an assumption. So I will be posting your next study set and worksheet due next Tuesday, um, and you need to give yourself time to do it. It's a long weekend, and it's gonna be sunny, and maybe not. They never wanna tell us if Memorial Day is gonna be sunny or not. Um, make sure you give yourself time for the study set and worksheet. Uh, and you're always, almost always going to be making an assumption. Uh, and this is the hardest piece for most students, but it shouldn't be. If it is a percent, the assumption you make is that your sample is 100. So when we did empirical formula back in 221, that was the assumption we always made. 
So our assumption is that we have 28 grams of NH3. And this is what I was trying to point out earlier. It doesn't tell you what the solvent is. So if I don't tell you the solvent, you assume it is H2O. And that would be 72 grams. So we have a 100 grams of our solution. This assumption is if you're dealing with a percent because percents are out of 100. Um, we'll do a different one on Thursday that will make a different assumption. But this is a nice place to start for the first day where we're just seeing all the different types of units. Um, so the rest of this is pretty straightforward. Oh, I'll stay over here. Uh, we're going to do molarity. So always state what you're doing first, which is going to be our moles of solute. And again, you can either say solute or you can say NH3 because that's what it is for this problem. And we're going to do it over the liters of the solution. Don't abbreviate because you will confuse yourself since everything starts with SOL. UT here even. All right, so I'm gonna do this as one setup, but you could break it into steps. But it is really nice and neat to do it as one setup. So again, labeling everything clearly, I have 28 grams of NH3, and then I'm gonna change it to moles. So we add up the nitrogen and hydrogen, and we will get 17.034 uh, grams to one mole of NH3. All right, so that's my numerator. I got my moles. In my denominator, I have to get to volume. So what I know is I have, a, it has to be of the solution. I know I have 100 grams of solution. And again, you need to have it fully labeled. You may have noticed if you look at your test that I posted back for you, it's under your grade, you have to go under grade book. Um, but it's really hard for me to do annotations. There's actually apparently the same problem in Blackboard because they're upgrading Blackboard to some fancy annotation thing. But um, historically in the past where I had pen and pencil to write on everyone, just the feedback that I just kept saying was, please label, please label completely. So you do need to label completely to get full credit. Um, what we know about the solution in terms of volume is the density. So 0 0.90 grams to one milliliter. So that was from up here, it was given. And then we know there's a thousand milliliters to one liter. So this whole piece down here will get me to the liters of the solution and you would punch the whole thing in. So you can find the top and then the bottom and then bring it together, or you can do it in one big step and you get a crazy concentration. Uh, pretty much anything over one is, is pretty highly concentrated. 15 molar, this thing's gonna knock you out if you smell it, because NH3 is a pretty strong smell. All right. Molality, so this top one again is molarity. Capital M. You guys should be, have seen that many times when we used to be in lab, things were always labeled as molarity. Molality has a specific use and we will get to that on the next page, which we're almost at. Uh, always state first your formula, which is the moles of the solute. And this one is just kilograms of solvent. That will help you also to keep track of what you're doing. So this is a way of organizing. So our numerator is going to be the same, that we'll have the 28 grams of NH3, which is our solute, and we'll change our grams to moles. So again, if you actually had figured out the numerator, you could just pull that number down here and label it moles of NH3. Our denominator is just the H2O. But, so the 72 grams of H2O, we need to change it to kilograms. So one kilogram 
is a thousand grams. My suggestion is that you do it what I just did, that you show the step. Having taught this for 25 years, which is older than most of you, um, but not all of you, is well, you guys have an advantage because you're at home and you're actually in a calmer situation. Um, but most students move their place value really weird when they try to do it in their head. Um, so showing the step should help you not to do that. Um, but we do need to be in kilograms and we would punch this in and we get an even crazier number, which yes, this should be approximately 23. And then it's, I always write it as just a little m. Um, two sig figs, because my original numbers only had two sig figs. You can write it like that, or you can write it as 23 moles per kilogram. Same with up here, you could write it, I like to write it as a big M, or you can write it as 15 moles per liter. Uh, when you write it as a unit with the number, like that is your answer, you don't have to say solute over solvent or however it is said. So that's it, that's the units. One page done. Is there questions? You're all good? There's still some people there. I can see it. All right. I'm going to erase. Melissa May says, stop. I'm erasing. So it really looks easy, right? And I actually think solutions are not bad at all. Um, my perception for students is that you get careless and if you don't label all your pieces um, that's when you run into trouble with this so as long as you label everything and you guys have a huge advantage it was a conversation I had with my son uh, he said how do people do this how did they memorize all this stuff and I'm like that's how it always was and so suddenly since you guys are at home you have your notes you just want to put everything like you did on this last midterm, I would suggest making a note page um, for the midterm because it will again be uh, the limited time. Um, in the past, it was always a two hour exam. Uh, I give you a little bit extra time because home has distractions. All right, we're gonna do what's called colligative properties. And this is just a really fancy word. That means uh, a solvent's behavior changes when you add a solute. So the solvent behavior changes when you add the solute. And so, this was the most missed thing on your midterm was when I asked, does your answer make sense? And almost all of you said, well, yeah, my pressure went up, so my volume went down. Of course, an elephant sat on the can. Um, I wanted you to explain it in a chemical way. So you're gonna see that here with these. So the first thing we're gonna do is VP, which is vapor pressure. And we talked about this briefly when we did liquids. It is again um, the gas that escapes a liquid. So that is the key, it's vapor. So it was a liquid and it suddenly became a gas. Things that are truly gas would be like in the room right now, we have oxygen and CO2. They were always in that gas state. So the key is to escape, which means it has to overcome any attractions. And this is the key. Before it was IMFs, and so when it was pure solvent, it only had to be attracted to itself. It was a narcissist. 
but now it has something else to be attracted to. So when you add the solute, it is in love. The solvent doesn't want to leave the solute. So the solvent is in love. It has higher attraction. And so less escapes. And that is the hope is what's happening to all of us now that we're like in our homes that we don't want to escape anymore. We're actually with the people that we wanted to live with, uh, that we love very much. So we're not going out as much. We're finding we don't need to go out as much. Um, so we're staying inside in the liquid state. We're not escaping. All right. Maybe you guys feel different, but I enjoy being at home. Uh, and so there's a law and it's, Bryolt's law, I'll write it, oh, we'll write it right here. So P equals X and P. And so it's at the top of your page. Um, you can't write it just like that. You need to label all the pieces. And it's all about the solvent. It is the solvent's behavior. So this is the pressure of the solvent. And this is the mole fraction of the solvent. This is probably the hardest piece of this. Um, what we just did was the mole fraction on the previous page on question number one was the mole fraction of the solute. We're going to now do it of the solvent. This, this colligative properties is all about the solvent. And this P, the way I gave it to you, yeah, this is the P of the solution or the final P. If you look it up or you look in the book or online, it will always have here is a little not sign or a zero. This is of the pure solvent. And then it's actually the pressure, how much of the solvent has escaped once it's mixed with the solute. Um, so let's go ahead and try and solve the problem. And state always just like gas laws it looks like gas laws kind of sort of maybe not it has p's in it uh state your formula because it's vapor pressure and it wants to calculate the final vapor pressure of the solution and to do this we need to find the x of the solvent so i did this wrong when i first set it up because i did the mistake that my students have always done um, I just immediately wanted to solve for the solute. So in this problem, something interesting happens. There is more of the solute than the solvent. There's 14 grams of the ethylene glycol and 10 grams of the water, but it, it, water always gets to be the solvent. I had a student many, many years ago who argued this with me, and I went and asked, every single chemist we worked with um, and every single one of them I didn't tell them that a student had questioned me and every single one of them looked at me like water's always the solvent if it's present um, they kind of gave me the dull look like get on the game lady but uh, so the water is the solvent so we want to find the moles of the H2O over the moles of the H2O plus the moles of, I'm just gonna say glycol, which that was the solute. And again, you guys know how to do this. You just change your grams to moles um, and you would show your work. And this would give you the mole fraction of the water. So that is going to be the X of the water. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time walking through every step. Um, for those of you who care, I would tell you absolutely to go through and solve these because I do give you answers here. Um, but to do it, to make sure you get the answer. And if you have trouble, just send me an email and say, hey, on page 20, because we have page numbers now. I don't know what they mean, though. Um, when you did the the vapor pressure problem, I'm not getting your answer. And if you can, you can take a picture or we can look at it. Um, on Thursday, when I do the notes, I'll do it with that overhead screen, right? And then I gave you a pressure. 
we would multiply that by 1070 tor. We'd put it in our calculator and you would get a final answer of 760 tor. And then I'm going to ask you if it makes sense. And you would say, absolutely. When I add the solute, the solvent's in love, it has a higher attraction, less escapes. Less escapes means the vapor pressure goes down. The more solute you add, the more attraction there is, the more the vapor pressure goes down. So it's kind of like chocolate. You just don't want to leave. You just want to keep eating the chocolate. That's my addiction. Um, so it's holding on to it. It doesn't escape. Questions? And again, on Thursday, we'll do another problem, I'm pretty sure, of these. And then your homework, we'll do these. Um, we're going to do the problem at the bottom of the page, which, um, go ahead. Oh, uh, I have a quick question. I was wondering with the tour being included, will we ever have to co convert to ATM? You know, that's a great question. Um, whatever unit the problem, for vapor pressure, Vapor pressures are, for some reason, always in tor or millimeters of mercury. Remember the same thing? Um, so unless it said convert to ATM, I just leave it in tor. There, okay. The other question or point I should have said is you will always see if you look at the problem, it gave a temperature. The temperature is is not used to solve, but um, the vapor pressure changes with temperature. Uh, and so this is a really high vapor pressure because we're above the boiling point of water. Um, mm -hmm. But once we add the ethylene glycol, we pull it, its boiling point is now 110 degrees. So as you add solute, that's gonna be the next thing we talk about, we lower the boiling point. Um, so the temperature you can ignore, um, it's just the vapor pressures are very temperature specific. Did I answer your question, Aaron? You could just keep mm -hmm. it. Yeah, um, uh, whenever, just uh, use the unit that's provided. And uh, also, yeah, then the temperature thing as well. Yeah, um, um, uh, in the problem like this, uh, tour is, uh, is very temperature specific. Yes. So uh -huh. it will give you the same temperature throughout the problem, and you can ignore the temperature. Uh, in the past, mm -hmm. I used to make the students look up the vapor pressures, like online, there's these big charts and stuff, but that it's, it's just as easy for me to give it to you. You know how to look up charts. Um, if anybody else has a question, just pipe in. I'm just going to write down the question at the bottom of the page where we're going to compare these solutions. So. The question wants, wants us to rank from lowest to highest, and there's two pieces here. Um, as you add more solute, you're going to decrease the vapor pressure, but to figure out how much solute, you have to factor in the molality times the number of particles or ions of the solute. So it is something, I think I talk about more on Thursday, but I wanted to do one question today. Uh, that So pure water would mean there is no solute. So there is no concentration. You cannot do a concentration unless you have a solute and a solvent. Glucose does not have ions. It is just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So there's only gonna be one particle. So whatever you start with, that is your concentration. But this is a piece we've never really talked about. So sodium chloride is made up of sodium and chloride. When you put it into the water, the sodium and chloride will break apart. So you will have sodium ions and chloride ions. So you have 0.6 molar of each one of them now. So you really have times two. I'm gonna say times two ions. So this is really a 1.2 molal solution. So it's actually, even though it looks like it's lower, it's actually higher than the glucose. And then the last one, the calcium chloride, 
because calcium has a plus two charge, there's actually two chlorides. So in our solution, we would have a calcium ion and then the chlorides would come apart and each one of them would be 0.5. So we would be multiplying by three ions. So we would get 1.5 is our concentration. So the pure water again has no concentration. The glucose is just whatever it started with because it's not an ion. So you just take it right across. Uh, and then the other ones you multiply by how many ions they have. And our rule for vapor pressure, as you add solutes, sorry, as you increase the solute, you're gonna have more love, so no escaping, so you're gonna decrease the vapor pressure. So the pure water is our highest VP. It's gonna escape, it doesn't care. The calcium chloride, because it has the highest concentration, is our lowest vapor pressure. So the more solute that's in there, uh, and so every ion has an attraction for the water. So more ions means more attraction. And that's it for vapor pressure for today. Questions? I'm going to erase. Unless somebody has a question. Look at that. We're halfway through. All right. So one colligative property down. And so now I'm page 21, and we're going to talk about freezing point. So FP is freezing point. So instead of, they always talk about it as freezing point because they're looking at the liquid becoming a solid. So these colligative properties are assuming you're starting as a liquid um, and boiling point. So, right, not blood pressure. So the liquid turning into a gas, and this case is the liquid turning into a solid. And again, this is the solvent. So when you add a solute, the difference between a liquid and a gas, which you guys all did great with this on the test, um, is IMFs. So the gas has weak IMFs. So when we add our solute, love, we're in love, so less escapes. So you're going to need to get to more and more jiggles. We're going to have to increase the temperature more. So we're going to have a much higher boiling point. So they're holding hands tighter and tighter and tighter, and so you're going to have to really jiggle them. Jiggle, 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 and then it can escape. So as you add solute, boiling point goes up. And that, that makes sense. The vapor pressure dropped because it's not escaping. So you need more jiggles and giggles to escape. So it's kind of like you're laughing so hard, you have to leave. So I don't know. Um, the difference between a liquid and a solid, they both have IMFs. We're not overcoming IMFs here. The big thing that makes a solid special is it makes a regular pattern. So it typically makes a crystalline structure or a lattice, latest, uh, which is the picture there. And on your midterm, most of you drew the beautiful honeycomb pictures here. Well, what happens when you add the sol solute is the solute is it's it's blocking its ability to make the so the solute interferes with the pattern this is why in the winter time we not here but in most states they add salt to the road. We treat the roads when you get ice. Um, here, we do not treat the roads because of the salmon. 
the um, stuff they use to treat the roads actually destroys their habitat and they've already been destroyed enough by many different things, including the warming temperatures. So as you add solute, you decrease the freezing point. So it can't freeze normal. Um, and so they call this freezing point depression. So it becomes depressed, which I always thought was the weirdest term. Uh, the lab we normally would do would be the sad freezing point lab. Um, yeah, you're going to do a solutions lab next week with this stuff a little bit at home. You'll get to do some calculations with this. Uh, now, if you live in really cold places like Minnesota and Alaska and Canada, they actually cannot decrease the freezing point enough, and so it still freezes. So they actually put sand on the road, and in that case, they're just looking for um, something to give them uh, traction. And yeah, and then I learned um, in Wisconsin they use. So remember, you guys did the cheese lab and you kept the casein, and the stuff that went through was the whey. So all that waste that you ended up throwing down the drain, uh, they actually found, because Wisconsin is the cheese capital of the country, they actually found that keeps the roads from freezing. And so that's what Wisconsin now puts on the roads in the winter, is all that waste from the cheese making uh, keeps the roads from freezing. Kind of cool story. Anyway, that'd be a fun topic. You guys, need to be giving me topics. So if you haven't given me a topic, you probably, um, well, you need to. You're gonna have me keep asking you. So, and it has to be a topic you find interesting, not me. All right, so let's do the problems on this page or walk through how to do them. Um, and yeah. All right. So, oh, there you go. Here's some more ideas for, I wrote these problems to try to give some people ideas for topics. Um, one year I had a bunch of people picked uh, different essential oils. So eucalyptus, uh, yeah, uh, is used topically for pain relief. There's a whole bunch of them uh, I'm looking for. So the question wants us to find the freezing point and it tells us, we have 0 0.600 kilograms CHCl3 and 42 grams of the C10, the eucalyptus stuff. C10 H18O, which is the eucalyptus stuff. So this one, um, these are both nonpolar. Well, kind of, sort of. Anyway, this is, uh, water's not involved here. So the minor one is the solute. The one you have much less of, and the one you have more of is the solvent. So I commented on that, that if they don't tell you the solvent, it is water. Um, but if they give you two pieces, then the major one is the solvent and the minor one is the solute. And then it's gonna give you um, the formula, which is at the top of the page, and I apologize. This formula is the same for boiling points and freezing point. Um, so you can either write this with the F for freezing point, or you can write it with a B for boiling point. It's the exact same formula. This K is um, a constant and it is specific for each compound. So it's specific for the solvent. And you're either gonna be given it or you're gonna be solving for that piece. So in lab, I think that's actually the first step of the lab is you figure out the K value by doing some experiment. Um, so in this problem, it gave us the K. And the units of constants are always funky. So you just go with what the units are. Uh, and then the other point is this triangle, my funky triangle. Triangles always mean this is 
temperature change. So it is not the freezing point that we care about or the boiling point. It is the change in them. And then this M is molality. That was the moles per kilogram. The only use I have ever seen for molality is freezing point, depression, and boiling point. I've never seen it anywhere else um, except with these problems. Uh, everywhere else uses molarity or percent or something like that. All right, so let's go ahead and solve it. So we have state the formula you're using. So delta T equals K times M. And you can write it like that, or you can, um, but we'll go with it. And I gave you the two freezing points. No, we're solving for freezing point. All right, so we're gonna plug in. I'm gonna solve for the change in temperature, and that is what I would recommend. 4.68, show your units. And M is gonna be, we have 42.0 grams of the eucalyptus thing, the C10H18O. And we have to change that to moles. So remember molality was moles per kilogram. So you would change your grams to moles. And I think I figured this out. It's around 154 grams to a mole. And again, I'm gonna do this as one setup because that's how I like to do it. Uh, you can break it into steps. You can figure out your moles and then bring it into there. So um, you guys did beautifully with this like on the test that some of you would do everything in one setup and some of you broke it into steps, but you did it in a very linear fashion. And then this would be the 0 0.600 kilograms. And you can write solvent or you can write CHCl3. So again, this is the solute on top and this is the solvent. So however you like to measure or to write it. And again, molality we went through on the first page is moles of the solute per kilograms of the solvent. You punch this in and you should get delta T is around 2.13 degrees Celsius. That is not the answer. That is how much the temperature changed by around two degrees Celsius. I want to know what is the final freezing point. So the normal freezing point was negative 63.5. The, the way my brain thinks about this, I have to always think about it. When you're doing freezing point, the freezing point would decrease. If you were doing boiling point, it would increase. So if we got 2.13 and we were doing boiling point, my final answer would go up by that much, but I'm doing freezing point. So it's gonna go down. So it's gonna be negative 65.6 degrees Celsius. So it's gonna decrease by 2.1. And then it says, does it make sense? And we would go back to, yes, adding solute decreases the freezing point. And you would not get full credit. You would get one out of three points. And you would have to say the solute interferes, we already wrote this up above, the solute interferes with the pattern. Um, actually, um, I do have one. Go ahead. Um, the so you're saying that um, if the freezing point is what we're finding, if the question asks us to find the freezing point, then that 
um, equation still stays constant, but the answer changes, like the answer changes where it's yes. going up or down. Okay, yeah. I see. Okay. If you were doing, if the question had had is fine boiling point, our final answer would have gone up by that change in temperature. Um, mm -hmm. And the other point that's constant is different for freezing point and boiling point. So whatever the constant is, I will give it to you in the problem or you'll be solving for it. But yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go through how to set up the next one. And it tells you again, it's, this is what we used to do in lab. Um, so next week's lab, you're going to get to do uh, like a little bit of problem solving with this, but I have other stuff for you to do. Uh, and so it tells us this is an unknown. And there's some words here that are important that we make sure we understand. Um, it tells you it's non-volatile. And this unknown is the solute. And non-volatile means, any ideas? It also tells us it's a non-electrolyte, which is important. So non-volatile means it does not evaporate. And that's actually really important. Um, you're going to see this. Usually, you should see this when we're doing colligative properties because it's important that if the solute was evaporating also, uh, it would affect our final answer because it would be adding to the gas, the vapor above the liquid. Um, Non-electrolyte means it's not an ion. And that was important for what I was doing on the previous page where the ions broke apart and so we have to factor that in when we're doing the calculations. Um, and so we don't have to worry about any of those situations. Uh, we, we, on Thursday, I'm gonna do a problem where we're gonna work with electrolytes and do the math. And then I think on the worksheet, I give a problem where you do have a solute that is volatile. Um, and I tell you what you have to do, which is extra steps. And so you'll see that's several extra math steps. All right, um, and it's a freezing point problem, so you can state the formula. This is something that I like to do is you can just write it as moles or the molality, or you can write it as moles per kilogram. Um, and this, you can actually label it even better. If you remember earlier, I said label it better. Um, this would be moles of the unknown. And this would be over kilograms. And I think I told you the solvent was the camphor. So this is how you can also write it out. You can simply write it as the formula at the top of the page, or you can write it out like that. Um, what I like to do, the question wants us to find the molar mass. And molar mass is grams per mole. So the piece that we're going to use freezing point for is to find the moles of the unknown. So you can rearrange this whole thing, right? So you're going to take your change in temperature, we know is 3.1 degrees Celsius. We know the K which is huge, 40 degrees Celsius per M. We're gonna have X as our moles. And then the kilograms of camphor was given in the problem, 22 grams, which we can change to kilograms. All right, we're gonna rearrange and we solve for X. I solved for X already, just in the interest of time, right? So you would divide by the 40 and multiply by the 0 0.022, and I get 0 0.0017 as my moles. And this is of my unknown. Basically, this was my first step. So this is my step one. 
And then my step two is in the problem it gave you, you had 0.186 grams of your unknown. So that was given. Like in lab, you would have, remember in the lab, we used to have scales, all that good stuff. I went to school on Saturday. It was quite odd because I hadn't been there for six weeks. And then we bring in the 0 0.0017 and you'd put that in your calculator. Now, the thing that I will point out to you, and when we actually do this lab, um, you all did in 221, if you did it at Mount Hood, you did a titration. And titration is very, very precise. We were able to have four sig figs. This is extremely imprecise. We can only have two sig figs. It is only an estimation. It just gets us roughly there. So all we can say is it's around 110 grams per mole. You cannot be more precise than that. And it goes back to the change in temperature um, only allowed us to have two sig figs. If you remember, yeah, when we did the calorimetry lab, calorimetry was a very imprecise art, and so is this. But um, it is something you can do with colligative properties. So back in the old days, like six weeks ago, when we all like lived in the real world, uh, we used to take an exam in 223 that was over the whole year. And this problem was always on the exam. Um, so it was from the American Chemical Society. And that problem we did on the previous page at the bottom with the vapor pressure, that was always on the exam because there are two big points to get. But um, questions? Doing all right? All right, we got one more page to do tonight. And I'm gonna erase. We're doing okay for time. I don't have a clock. All right, we're gonna do osmosis. So this is the fourth colligative property we're going to talk about. Um, so there's only four, and osmosis has to do with osmotic pressure. We're going to get end with some cartoons, so you can get a chance to write, make your own cartoons up. Osmosis is the movement of solvents. So it's actually my students who've taken like a lot of anatomy and physiology, they should be good at this, but they often get it backwards. Um, again, it's a colligative property and colligative properties are about the solvent. So it's the movement of the solvent and it's across what's called a semi-permeable membrane. Uh, and even those, of, a lot of you are going towards engineering. So you've heard of reverse osmosis. And I'll talk about that as we do some of these examples. Um, so your cell membrane are semi-permeable. The solvent can grow across, but other stuff is not going to go across. So, all right. So why should you care? Osmosis is actually huge. It's, it's one of the biggest points. Uh, it is not how the water gets to the top of trees. So trees don't absorb water through their, their pine needles or their uh, leaves. They have to absorb it through their roots, but it is it is part of the idea of how the water gets to the top of the trees. Osmotic pressure would be, so if we had like chamber A and B, and just for simplicity, we'll say this side is 5% and this side is 10% of whatever, glucose. We'll go with glucose.
And this is the membrane that's separating them. Well, what's gonna happen is the glucose, the solute does not move. So with all of these, the solute does not move. It is the solvent. It's all about the solvent. And so the solvent wants both sides to be the same. So the solvent, which is gonna be water, is gonna move towards the side that's 10%. And this is why I said some students always have trouble with this because it moves to the side with the higher concentration because it's trying to make the two sides the same. So the solvent is gonna move towards the 10%. Osmotic pressure would be if we were pushing down, so I just say OP. Osmotic pressure would be the pressure that we'd push down to keep the solvent from moving across. Um, and so that's the idea of osmotic pressure. So the solvent is gonna be attracted to the side with the higher concentration. So remember, solute and solvent love each other, they adore each other. Um, and so the higher concentration is pulling them across. And so this side's gonna become less volume, but more concentrated. And the other side, it's gonna increase its volume. Um, all right, these are really easy problems to solve. So remember PV equals NRT? That was like um, one of the two things you'll remember from our experience. This term, perhaps, is PV equals NRT. When you take physics, which a high amount of you will be taking physics, when you do gas laws, you're going to be awesome at them. Um, and actually, when you do calorimetry, you're going to be awesome at them. So we're going to be solving this P is osmotic pressure. So we're gonna divide by the volume, but I'm gonna do it in a funny way. I'm gonna put the volume under the N because what this gives me now is moles per liter, which is molarity. Now I'm gonna solve it as PV equals NRT, but the way the formula is given, that is the symbol for osmotic pressure. It's a capital pi, it's not the curly pi, it is a flat pi, uh, equals, and instead of saying N over V, they say capital M, and that means molarity. I don't like this formula, how it's written in all the books. I'm mentioning it and I don't like it because a lot of students get mixed up with that M means because we saw capital M used in one of our other gas law formulas. I prefer to go back always to PV equals NRT, but um, that's why I gave it up there. I said, you can use the formula like this or you just use the gas laws because you already, you already know it. All right, so I'm gonna solve it as PV equals NRT. If you state your formula, we're gonna solve for osmotic pressure. You can divide by V however you want. And I'm just gonna go ahead and solve. We have 2.02 .02 grams. That looks like urea. Right. I don't know what that is. I think it is. So this is our NH22CO, because I'm gonna label. Change your grams to moles. Then you multiply by R. You guys remember R, 0 0.082, 0 0.057. You don't have to remember it. You just have to look it up. Uh, and then temperature. Do you remember temperature you always change to? And they all say Kelvin. So let's move this. All right, and then I gave a volume. Oh yeah, you add this up. This was like around 60 grams per mole. You guys all know I use your periodic table. Um, and so 145 milliliters, but you have to be in liters. Just change your milliliters to liters. And you punch this in and you get this crazy number always. 5.58. And 
I would encourage you guys when you watch the video, those of you watching the video, that you pause and you try and set it up yourself. Cover up what you did, do it again, punch it in, make sure you get my answer. Um, and back to the question Erin had asked me earlier with vapor pressure. Vapor pressures are given in tour and they're usually really small. Um, Osmotic pressures are always given in ATMs and they're outrageously huge. I mean, if you had an air pressure of five ATMs, we would all be crushed, right? Atmospheric pressure right now in all of our households is around one. And this is like at the bottom of the sea and you would just be crushed by that much pressure. Um, and so osmotic pressure is not measuring air pressure, it is, this idea of osmosis, of that pull of the solute and the solvent for each other. Um, and so they do it in ATMs. Um, I don't feel it's comparable to how gases behave, um, but the answer makes, I don't know how we can say the answer makes sense. There's a huge attraction. The solvent's getting pulled across. Um, questions before we do the cartoons, and then we'll be done. All right, so let's do the little cartoons of osmosis and these terms. And right. so we have isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. I'm really hoping I hit record. Um, yeah, I did. So I did for my other class, I had to record three times one of my lectures last week. Um, so the first time I forgot to hit record, it was an hour and 45 minutes. I think, it, it, and then I did it a second time and I thought it would be really cool to play music in the background, calming music. You know, when you hear the professional videos, well, how Zoom works, when you have music on your computer, Zoom is playing the music in the foreground, and so you couldn't hear my voice. So another hour and 45 minutes. So by the third time, I just like talked pretty fast, and it only took an hour and a half. So um, I have no idea what is in the video anymore, but hopefully I don't have to do that with your class. All right, the, the tonic part of this is salt. Um, ISO means same, so you can think of it as salt concentration. Oh, by the way, the plastics lab, which probably most of you will do before you watch this video, but there is a bonus in the lab to come up with your own experiment with the plastics, like your own little test. And I'm hoping you guys will give me ideas because I think we're gonna be at home again doing experiments. And so I'm really excited for that. Um, so this means we're usually, I mean, we're gonna talk about it as a cell. So this is a cell and we're gonna say this cell is 0.9 um, molarity. And so my cell is a happy cell because out here, it's 0 0.9 molar. That's isotonic. So there is a flow of solvent in and out all over. It is the same. Nothing's happening to my cell. It's very happy. Hypotonic means low. Hypo means low. Hyper is gonna mean high. So this means low concentration or uh, low salt. So my cell is still 0.9. And I don't know if you guys know Mr. Bill. He's saying, oh no, because he's 0.9. And we put him in something that's low, say 0.1. And what's gonna happen is the solvent has to move. The solvent has to move so the two sides are the same. And the solvent always moves to where it's higher. And so you're gonna get this flow in 
And what happens, oh, I'm gonna make it better. Your cell becomes very bloated. So he's gonna swell, not meaning he feels swell, he's become swollen. Maybe we should write that, swollen. The girls usually know what bloated means because it's part of what it means being a female, but um, he gets, he swells up. And yeah, so hypotonic, they always swell up. Hypertonic, so this time, again, he's, oh no, he's 0.9, and the outside now is high, high salt. So the inside's 0.9 and the outside is like five molar. So this time all the solvent, again, the solvent's moving and it's gonna move out. And so what happens is he shrivels up. There's a fancy word for that and it's called crenate. So this is not the same as cremation, where when your dog dies, you can they cremate your animal, your pet, and then you can wear the ashes around in a necklace. A lot of people like to do that, whatever you like to do. It's crenate, which means it shrivels up. This is also what people told me to do when I first came here to Oregon. Um, and I planted a garden, and then I went out and I was horrified because there were slugs like I had never seen. I'm now one with the slugs. Every morning I meditate with the slugs. And anyway, so they told me to take salt. And so all the boys in the class start laughing because they all did this as little boys. And if you put salt on slugs, slugs, their, their surface is semi-permeable and the salt will suck out all the water in the slug and you'll watch the slug shrivel up right in front of you. And I was horrified. And, and then I had this slug guts all over, like, where I had just done this. And I was just horrified. And so then somebody told me, I was telling them my dismay. And they said, oh, no, no, no. You go get, like, a tin uh, and empty it. So you go have, like, tuna fish. And you empty it. So you eat the tuna fish. And then you fill it with beer, like the cheapest kind, like Budweiser or something. So I think I went and bought some Coors Light and poured it into the tuna fish cans and I put them outside and the slugs are attracted to it. Now you can buy like these hundred dollar ones that people make online or you just make it yourself with a can. And then I went outside like an hour later to see if it was working and there was a line of slugs, I kid you not, all the way coming from all my neighbor's houses. Apparently Coors Light was very popular amongst the slugs in my neighborhood. And they were now in there, and this apparently was a hypotonic solution, and all these slugs were in these tins, these empty tins that were filled with Coors Light, and they were now swollen and bloated, and they were actually quite content. They were like very happy because they were probably drunk, and they were dead, and they were so gross, and so I just have now become one with the slugs, and I deal with it, and they do eventually go away. Um, yeah, I, or I probably drink them in my smoothies every morning because every day I go out, my garden is just like huge right now. Um, the more I pick, the more I end up with. And I make our salad and smoothie every day from it. And I'm always finding slugs. Like I start it and then I'll go do something else because I have to give the slugs a chance to come out from hiding so I can get them out of there. Anyway, hypotonic, it swells. Hypertonic, it shrivels up. Um, and so when they give you an IV, like if you go in the hospital, they have to make sure it's isotonic so that your cells um, don't swell up. So like Alina will know this because she works as a medic. So this is something you learn when you become uh, an EMT, how important it is to make sure everything stays healthy. All right, that's all I got. Any questions? Again, on Thursday, we'll do the next three pages, um, which is, it goes through some terminology and then we'll do more practice with these.
and look at some other situations. Hello, Jim. Any questions? I'm going to stop recording. I'm good. <sighs> Everybody's good. Did it stop? <laughs> bye. Bye bye. <laughs>